What does the tennis world have to do with the translation world? Well, more than you think. I don't know if you're a fan of tennis, but in the early 2000s, researchers began to look into a technology called the Hawkeye. Well, what did the Hawkeye do? The Hawkeye was artificial intelligence that could map out exactly where a ball was bouncing and realize based on that bounce exactly if the ball was in or out. And if you're a tennis fan or not, you've probably seen heated arguments between tennis players when they're playing against each other, whether the ball was in or out, with umpires, with referees, if the tennis match is of more elevated status. But it's always questionable. And what's interesting about that technology is that for many years after it was developed, it wasn't really used widespread. The first tournament in which it was used was in 2006. And only recently has it become really begun to be used in a more widespread manner, replacing human beings. So let's talk about this and let's talk about more specifically about what's happening in the Australian Open. So the Australian Open taking place right now, January 21st, 2025 in Australia is one of the four Grand Slam tournaments. And in this tournament, they have completely replaced all of the lines people with Hawkeye technology. So it's it's what, what's called Hawkeye Live. The balls are deemed in or out immediately, right? So if we take a look at first the headline, right? With no human line judges in place, technology rules all of all at the Australian Open, and some of the players are not impressed. So interesting choices of words, right? Um, technology rules all at the Australian Open. A little bit sensationalist if we think about it. Technology is ruling just the line calls. There's still a chair umpire who's overseeing everything, who's willing to listen to the players, who's overseeing the quality of the lines calls. So not quite as described, right? And I, I think it's important to point out the sensationalism because there's a lot of parallels with sensationalism in our space as well. The second parallel that we see in our space is that machine translation, also similar to Hawkeye, has been creeping up growing since the early 2000s. Obviously, it's a lot older than that. It began in the 60s, if you take it way back as far as machine translation goes, but really began to be used in a more ubiquitous way starting, starting in the early 2000s. And the fears are always in parallel, right? Is it going to replace translators? Is it going to make everybody out of a job? And we've seen this continuous rise in machine translation, but still, translators are still very much used. Now, let's take a look at this first statement. I would rather not argue with people. I think the electronic line is calling, calling is good. It's great, Jennifer Brady enthused in Melbourne on Tuesday. There's nobody to argue with. If it's out, it's out. If it's in, it's in. Not quite true. You see a lot of players arguing with the chair umpires when they disagree with a particular call. Now, what's interesting is there's a big change in behavior. With lines people, you, the, the calls are inherently and intrinsically erratic, right? First, every lines person calls balls that are in, sometimes out, out that are in. You're relying on the human eye and things that are moving extremely fast. It's a very hard call to make, even for the trained eye. Second, players are second guessing those calls. So sometimes they stop playing a point in the middle of a point and they're questioning intrinsically also these calls because they know of their erratic nature. Now with the Hawkeye Live, you notice a very different player behavior. Most players are continuing to play through the point. They're not worrying about whether the ball is in or out. And it's curious, obviously this has to do with other factors as well, but players are not only playing closer to the lines, but they feel more comfortable taking these risks because they know that the ball needs to be fully out to be called out, right? If you look at the tennis rules, the ball cannot touch a single part of the line in order to be deemed out. And because the the ruling now is so precise, the line has in some ways become bigger. And when you think about what's what's going on here, there are so many different mechanisms that are the technology is actually changing the human behavior, not just directly but indirectly. Again, if you think about machine translation, you notice similar kinds of parallels. Now, this other sentence is pretty interesting as well. Humans are humans. Everybody makes errors, so I think electronic line is calling is great, and 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 now we're so we we have 
two sentences that talk about proponents, and now we're talking about isn't infallible either, um, and we're talking about errors, right? And now complaints and questions. So what's happening here in the article, which is very interesting, is that we're initially we're dividing the people in two basic camps. We're talking about on one hand the the people who are for it, and on the other hand the people who are against it. And this divisiveness really makes it hard for people to really understand how it can be good and how it can be bad. Now, let's just recap again on the parallels, right? Machine translation has been creeping up on the translation industry for a very long time. Translators have always treated it as their enemy. Same people, if you think about a, a lines referee, they would typically feel a lot more pressure using the Hawkeye because what happened for over more than a decade, when Hawkeye began to be used in tournaments, it was never replacing a line referee. It was always acting as a way for players to be able to challenge the referee calls, right? So the way it worked is the referee would make a line call, in or out, and the player had typically up to three challenges per set. So it was a, a way to allow the, the players to use technology to challenge human judgment. And in that way, placed a lot of, play, uh, of emphasis in the referees because now they were in the spotlight, right? If they were making a mistake, the entire stadium could see that mistake. And, and if it was an egregious mistake, that would, that would really count against them and um, maybe they wouldn't be called for the next tournament. So it, it really shifted the, 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 the dynamics. But again, the players still had to be keeping in their mind whether the ball was in or out, whether or not they were going to use a challenge. That was always something very strategic. So for a long time, we were, we were in this space where it was a hybrid kind of situation. Think about the parallel with humans, same thing. You're still in a space where most translations are going through some level of human intervention. And not to be too prophetic about it, but if you look at the tennis space, it took its time. Tennis is a very classic sport, very focused on adhering to its own rules and principles. And and unwilling to change these rules because it feels like it could be changing the essence of the sport. Similarly, language is a very personal thing. And I'm willing to propose that as good as the technology is, again, if you think about it, this is where the parallel gets crazy, right? The Hawkeye technology was pretty much good enough in the late 2000s, maybe 2008, 9, to already begin to, from a technological perspective, it was mature enough to be used at a much wider scale. But the culture just wasn't there yet. It took the culture almost 17 years to catch up to the technological maturity. We're finding kind of a similar thing taking place in translations, where for many kinds of translations, large language models, machine translation, technology that's out there, can produce pretty accurate and reliable translations. But even if that is the case, and I'm not saying that necessarily it is, even if that were to be the case, it still takes a long time for society as a whole to catch up. And in here, we're in one place, we're talking about an entirely self-contained sport owned and not owned, but governed by a single entity called the ATP. Sure, you have other federations that was well that runs, runs the Grand Slams, but basically managed by very few entities, whereas language touches on everything, right? Language is touches on all consumers of planet Earth. Language talk and, and touches on all kinds of regulating bodies, whether it's the FFA or whether it's the Health Administration or whether it's the Trade Council. It, it touches on everything, right? So to change things that rely on language is even a harder process than to change things that rely on a sport that's ruled by a, government, a single entity. So that, that aspect is fascinating. The second aspect that's fascinating is as you've replaced this very erratic way of calling shots with a much more precise way, you're changing player dynamics, players are becoming more focused on the game, and you're also changing how umpires behave because now the, 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 the tennis umpire is a lot more focused on, on running the match as a whole so one of the things players complain, and we'll take a look here at the article, is that there's a lot more a lot more focus on, for instance, keeping track of uh, how long players are taking to take the next shot. So th this uh, player here is criticizing on the court. You have this permanent feeling that time is against you with the towel, the warm up. When you constantly you have to stand up in 15 seconds, you want to say easy, man. So 
the second that you take off that responsibility from the empire of like controlling every single call, now they're focused more on making the game faster, making the game run. They have more bandwidth to focus on player interaction. So in many ways for the for the umpires and for, let's say, the speed and the dynamic of the game, it's very positive. Now let's talk about a place where it's not that positive. First, the, the, the lines people, the, the re line referees, they're gone. The tournament has now the ball boys that or ball girls, ball people that call, catch the the balls, but you no longer have people calling the line shots. And we're talking about in a large tournament, we're talking about hundreds of people, and these are hundreds less jobs. And not only that, but you also have another problem that's created, which is in the hierarchical chain that is necessary to produce umpires. Right? If you think about an umpire. I don't know many people who are born tennis umpires. Typically, you start either as a tennis enthusiast, and maybe you start um, as a ball person, and you move up from being a ball, ball person to a line person, and you're a line person for a few years, and you continue to move up the ranks, and you, you become calling, being participating in more and more important tournaments as a line person. Eventually, you begin to run some um, tournaments as an umpire, and eventually, you get you get into that career path, right? But we're talking about a, a a path that requires, necessitates different people at different level of, levels of experience and seniorities. Now, once you get rid of all of that, all of those people that are calling those line shots, now you have a big gap. It's very hard to be filled, right? You either have the expert umpires or you have really people just catching balls. And right now, maybe that's not a problem, but eventually a few years down the road, I'm willing to... to put my money on the fact that it's going to be harder for people to find and skill umpires. Similarly, if you think about the language industry, this has been, it's been my hypothesis that as the technology gets better and better, you're going to see few, less work available for people who are good at carrying words, people that do grunt work. You're going to see more work available for people that are extremely talented at copywriting or subject matter experts at very niche areas, they're going to be very necessary. And you still have the same problem where like the junior people, everybody who's a junior, typically you don't have the expertise. You're not, you're not a super skilled copywriter. You're not a subject matter expert. You're basically someone who can shine through working a lot, through work ethic, through determination, through resilience, through ability, and eventually you acquire the experience to get to those places. But now if, those, if, if all of that journey is wiped out, well, how do you go from being a junior to a senior in any given area? And it's not just in translation itself. I've read many reports around AI that show that there's a growing concern around this middle management or middle executor role kind of being wiped out because that's, that is, let's say, the sweet spot for AI. That's where it performs the best, at least for now. And... And that is a, a, a big question mark in the tennis world, and at least for me, and it's also a big question mark in the um, translation world itself. Now, another interesting thing that happens is it says, this is a problem, said the Frenchman. This is Gilles Simon criticizing, saying, A, it's monotonous, and this he says, it's this is impartial, neutral, but there is still bad faults. I experienced that in Cologne, and at some point, we like it when the judgment is fair. So that's very interesting, right? Yes, the machine will make mistakes. Uh, I don't have statistics exactly in front of me, but I'm very willing to bet that the, the Hawkeye is incredibly more precise than the human eye from a statistical perspective. Yes, when it makes mistakes, the mistakes are systemic, which in many ways makes them more glaring, more egregious, right? Let's say, for instance, if you have a poorly calibrated Hawkeye, Maybe the ball could be like smack in the middle of the court and it could call it out, right? Whereas the human eye probably won't make those mistakes. But when we're, if you're talking about a well-calibrated Hawkeye compared to a, a very well-trained human eye, the level of precision is going to be infinitely superior. But again, there's this bias, this negative bias towards systemic system errors or mistakes versus human errors. Human errors are more acceptable. And we I've read articles also about this, for instance, in the self-driving space, that a self-driving car would have to be more reliable, at least by an entire order of magnitude than a human being in all kinds of conditions in order to be deemed a viable alternative. So machines aren't set up 
to compete with humans at parity, they have to be a lot better than humans in order to be considered a replacement. But the most important part is when, when we look at all of this is that the game, the tennis game itself continues, right? It's not that, and, and I don't think anybody imagines that we plan on replacing the tennis players with machines. I don't think that's a, a fair kind of assessment. I think we still want the sport. We want the drama. We want the battles. We want the epic players. And, and that's just something that's that's part of human nature, in my opinion. Maybe I'm wrong, and we're going to see a bunch of robotic tennis players in the next few years. I highly doubt that. And I want to make that parallel. I think that's the most impar important parallel of this video, which is around language. Language is very much a human thing. Language is not a thing of machines. Yes, machines can do it. That's great. But language is what holds culture. Language is what holds identity. And the same way that I see, okay, we are delegating a part of tennis management line calling to machines, I think that we're de going to delegate a part of language management to machines. I don't think we're going to delegate language as a whole. Language is incredibly complex. And as much as you have, let's say, the parallel of Hawkeyes, for instance, maybe in Bureau Works you're looking at uh, smells, which is similar to Hawkeye. It's catching certain mistakes that could be present in language and alerting the translators. And again, we're at, still at that stage where it's this human-managed output, right? That Like the Hawkeye remained for many, many decades. It was... Many, many decades is an exaggeration for it. For at least 15 years, it be it was a, a human-managed output. You had the output, but the human had to call for the exception. And, and, and people would look at it and determine whether the call was good or bad. Same thing with smells, for instance, in Bureau Works. Bureau Works proposes a smell, but it doesn't autocorrect. It flags it to the human. The human decides what to do with it. Maybe we're going to stay in that paradigm for decades. Maybe we're going to move into a different paradigm where we're more comfortable accepting those changes proposed by smells. But what's important is that the parallel is we're looking at human actors, right? Tennis is a game of human actors. We use the technology to improve the experience of the human actors and the viewers. Language is a thing of human actors. And we use the technology to improve the experience of those human actors, whether they're authors or readers. And I think that's what's super important, right? I think instead of thinking about this fear of whether or not it's going to replace me and how, I think it's much more relevant to think about the ways in which it can be helpful, the ways in which it can be, can be harmful, and trying to extract the best at every single moment. This is Gabriel. Thank you so much for watching. If you liked the video, please like and subscribe. Would love to hear your comments. What are your thoughts? Do you see any parallels or have I just been watching too much tennis recently? Take care.